post-traumatic sternocovicular joint pain indications for arthroscopy. There are a number of causes for ongoing pain following a sternocovicular joint injury. They may be due to ongoing instability, such as subluxational dislocation. They could be due to an intraarticular pathology, to post-traumatic osteoarthritis, or an exacerbation of pre-existing osteoarthritis. This is probably the most common cause. They could be due to a loose body, a disc tear, or an exacerbation of a pre-existing inflammatory arthropathy. Other causes could be extra-articular, and this might be due to muscle sequencing or muscle patterning, related soft tissue injury, such as damage to the trachea or esophagus, or neurogenic. Diagnosing the cause obviously starts with the history. The most important fact is age. We looked at the sternoclavicular joint of 500 patients undergoing a CT scan for chest pathology. We found that there was an increasing severity of osteoarthritis with increasing age. Interestingly, we found that no patients under the age of 35 had any evidence of osteoarthritis. However, by the age of 50, nearly 60% of patients had osteoarthritis, and by the age of 100, 100% of patients had osteoarthritis. On examination of the joint, it's important to look for any evidence of any swelling or effusion or any erythema around the joint. Bony palpation of both the clavicular and sternal sides and also over the joint itself, so looking for any disc pain. Movements of the sternoclavicular joint are really looking at protraction of the joint, retraction of the joint, abduction and elevation of the joint, and external and internal rotation of the joint with the arm at 90 degrees. Whilst doing all of these movements, it's important to have your fingers over the joint to feel for any crepitus or discomfort. Plain x-rays of the sternoclavicular joint are difficult to interpret due to the underlying cervical spine. CT scans are very good at looking at for osteoarthritis of the joint and also the presence of any loose bodies. Reformatted CT scans can be useful if there's been any pre-existing surgery. If there are any concerns with regards to instability or a disc tear, the soft tissues are best assessed using an MRI scan. Recently in our unit we've moved towards using digital tomography. This is something that could be undertaken using a standard digital x-ray machine. Using auto positioning the x-ray machine can be programmed to undertake a set number of images over a set range. We set our machine to take 40 images between 45 degrees above and 45 degrees below the horizontal. This takes a matter of five seconds and exposes the patient to a very limited radiation. nice thing about this procedure is it can be done as a day case in the x-ray unit. It does not require any of the timings and expense uh, that are taken with a CT scan or MRI scan. The images can then be uh, viewed on a cine setting where you get a nice interpretation of any osteoarthritis. In this case, we can look at our post-operative excision of the sternoclavicular joint. In the vast majority of patients, the cause of their sternoclavicular joint pain is intraarticular. The first line of management should be non-steroidals coupled with physiotherapy. If this is unsuccessful, an ultrasound-guided cortone injection is useful both therapeutically but also diagnostically. For the group of patients with sternoclavicular joint osteoarthritis or disc tear that have failed conservative treatment, Arthroscopic surgery is indicated. This can be either an SCJ excision arthroplasty or an SCJ discectomy. Previously, an open excision of the medial end of the clavicle for osteoarthritis has been based on the principles of those of the lateral end of the clavicle, which involves excision of the lateral end of the clavicle. However, the two are not analogous. At the lateral end, the coracoclavicular ligaments are strong and will hold the clavicle in position regardless of the amount of bone that's removed. However, at the medial end, the costoclavicular ligaments are not strong. So if you remove any of the medial end of the clavicle, no matter what happens, it will collapse down. And this is regardless of how much bone is removed. Not only is there a difference between the costoclavicular ligaments and the coracoclavicular ligaments, but the anatomy of the medial end of the clavicle is very different from the lateral end. Classically, anatomical texts have shown that the whole of the medial end of the clavicle is covered with articular cartilage. In fact, a recent study by Millet's team have showed that it's only the lower two-thirds of the medial end of the clavicle that are covered by articular cartilage. 
In fact, the disk and the uh, capture structures insert into the superior third. Taking this into account, by excising the whole of the medial end of the clavicle is likely to destabilize the joint because part of its superior capture insertion will have been removed. In fact, only the lower two thirds of the medial end of the clavicle need to be excised. This is something that lends itself very nicely to an arthroscopic procedure. First of all, there's only a small area of bony congruence. The portals have to come in from the anterior surface, so it's important to avoid the anterior sternoclavicular joint ligament, so the portals need to be at the inferior and superior point of the joint. The other important factor is joint inclination. We undertook an axial CT study looking at the inclination of the sternoclavicular joint. What we found is rather than it being perpendicular to the plane of the chest, in fact the inclination of the sternal side of the joint is consistently at 30 degrees to the vertical plane. Taking these factors into account when starting a sternoclavicular joint arthroscopy, an inferior port is established first. This is done using a spinal needle at the inferior aspect of the joint, angled at 30 degrees the vertical plane. Normal saline is then infiltrated into the joint and the portal established. The superior portal is then established using an outside-to-in technique. This is the video of a 45-year-old lady who developed left sternoclavicular joint pain after an innocuous injury. This is probably due to pre-existing osteoarthritis. So the inferior portal has been established using the spinal needle and about 5 mils of fluid has been insufflated into the joint. We can see there's a little, just a little flashback so we know we're in the joint. So having done that we can now establish our inferior portal. So there's a 5 millimeter incision taken down onto the capsule. The trocar is inserted, there's a definite pop as it goes in. So having established that we then put the scope in. And now that we've got a clear view, we've used a spinal needle to establish this superior portal. So here are the trocars going on. So now we've got a inferior and superior portal. So this is the view inside the joint. Initially, there's quite a lot of uh, degenerate tissue. Pretty much every patient who's got a degenerative arthritis of their joint will have a degenerative disc tear. So at the begin beginning of the procedure, it's important to remove all of the soft tissue. So the, we're going to excise the medial end of the clavicle, so that's going to be on the right-hand side. So we're just using the radio frequency probe to remove all of the tissue and re remnants away from the lateral end of the clavicle, sorry, the medial end of the clavicle. So we've now removed all of the tissue, and we're going to use a burr, and we're going to use a cutting technique starting from the superior part of the entire articular bit of the bone so this is at about the uh, junction between the superior middle thirds of the joint then just doing this burr we're going to excise the bone in an undercutting fashion so we're coming from anterior to posterior we've now removed the bone we're right down at the inferior part of the joint so this is just the inferior ostophyte now that we need to excise as the procedure progresses and we remove more bone, it becomes increasingly easier to access the joint. So we're just using the shaver now just to remove that inferior part of the joint. So we now have excised all of the intra-articular part of the medial end of the clavicle. So the superior third is still in place, so we haven't really affected stability of the joint at all. We've previously published the results of a prospective series of 10 patients with SCJ osteoarthritis. They'd all failed conservative management. Seven of them have had an ultrasound guided cortisone injection with temporary benefit. All the procedures were done as day cases and the average follow-up was 28 months with a standard deviation of 8.1. Their mean Rockwood SCJ score had risen from 5.7 preoperatively to 12.9 postoperatively. And their mean constant score had risen from 64.5 to 83 postoperatively, which was statistically significant. There were no complications and specifically no evidence of instability. All the patients were pleased with the results of the surgery and be happy to undergo the procedure again. We've just completed a similar study of 50 patients that has been accepted for publication, which again has shown the same results. Intraarticular disc tears are relatively rare 
and tend to be the result of a shearing injury to the disc. They can be acute and tend to occur in younger patients under the age of 35, or they can be chronic and are exacerbated by an injury in older patients between about the ages of 35 to 50. Diagnosis is really done under an MRI scan and there's a fairly classic finding of edema but also a wavy appearance of the disc where it's been ruptured. There's often minimal degenerative articular involvement. This is an 18 year old patient who had an acute disc tear playing hockey. This is the left sternoclavicular joint and we can see he's got a complex tear of the disc. It's a little bit harder to arthroscope because it's difficult to get the scope in initially so we're going to remove all of the damaged disc and essentially we need to reset the disc back to a stable rim so we're just getting back to the stable rim and we can see that the uh, the articular surfaces are relatively intact this next patient is an older patient who had a chronic tear so in this case you can see the disc is already retracted back and there's a rolled edge it's a little bit of degenerative frame, the articular surface themselves are intact. This is a left joint, so it's really a case of just removing the frond-like tissue. We can see the disc, it's still attached posteriorly, so it's detached anteriorly. We're going to bring in a mini punch and just going to remove the main substance of the disc. And once again, the goal is re to retract this back to a stable rim. So we're just using the shaver now, so we've got this right back to a stable room, so all the fragments have been removed. And you can see the articular cartilages are relatively preserved, so there's no significant degenerative change. This is the probe just to show that the disc is now stable, so there will no longer be any impingement or creptus as the joint protracts and retracts. We looked at a case series of 14 patients who had disc tears. Ten of them were acute disc tears. They all described a specific instance and their average age was 27 and a half years. Most of them described a sudden pop and pain with associated clicking. Four of the patients described a more degenerate disc tear, so this was more of a gradual onset and their average age was older, though 36.8 years. Once again, they described a gradual onset of pain and clicking. They all underwent an arthroscopic discectomy and an average follow-up of 33.4 months. Their Rockwood scores had risen from 7 to 13.6. Their visual analogue score for pain from 6.1 up down to 1.2. And their quick dash score from 23.7 down to 8. There were no complications. And 13 of the patients were pleased with the results and would undergo the procedure again. <coughs> so in summary, post-traumatic SCJ pain is rare. Its causes may be due to instability, an intra-articular origin or an extra-articular origin. It's best diagnosed by taking a thorough history and examination. An imaging following this would include a CT scan and a digital tomogram and an MRI scan if instability or disc tear are considered. The first line of treatment for patients whose pain is due to an intra-articular origin is anti-inflammatory tablets and if this doesn't work, an oxyangali cortisone injection local anaesthetic. In their rare occurrence where patient symptoms fail or are resistant to non operative measures, sternoclavicular joint arthroscopic surgery can be a successful treatment. If you'd like to know more about sternoclavicular joint arthroscopy or any other sternoclavicular joint conditions, visit my website www.cambridgeshoulder.co.uk if you click on the sternoclavicular joint tab, you can see all of the conditions that are discussed.